but so to kind of touch on the the kind of core um the core ideas that you've been kind of defending both from this kind of the buddhist philosophy and from evolution i think this idea of selflessness or not self or no self um is really kind of at the core of um of all of this i, I would say especially when it comes to one's own suffering right and you um use this this concept of the ceo self which i think is a good description for our folk psychology of how we feel our minds mm -hmm. typically work right um yeah maybe you could say something about what you what it is like for us usually but also how mm -hmm. we can understand that as being an illusion yeah so so first of all i'd say there are kind of two facets of at least two of the not self question there's first of all not self is a philosophical um doc and a psychological doctrine a statement about the actual nature of what you think of as the self and then there's a moral implication of it the idea being that if you let go of the false notion of the self that most of us labor under you will probably become a better person because you will obviously be less inclined to privilege yourself over others if you don't believe that, that yourself exists but um so yeah uh, certainly the uh, an intuitive idea of like you know when i what if i ask you what do you mean by yourself i think a lot of people would think of this kind of the ceo this thing that's in charge of my body and my behavior it's it's the it's at the top of the hierarchy it's making the decisions i feel like i'm making the decisions um and that's what i mean by the self the the, the thing in charge and buddhism and i and i should say like you know if you go back into the ancient texts figuring you know people can argue and do argue about what what was actually meant by the the term not self you know early on in the teachings of the buddha you know how, how should we think about this idea of not self but certainly one notion you find in early texts is that the buddha is rejecting the idea that there's this like king in your head this ruler in your head and that that is the self and you know as i'm sure you know for some decades now psychology has been uh calling into question the idea of of the self as as kind of intuitively conceived i mean there are the famous split brain experiments um which uh i mean are, are they now i don't know you tell me whether we should assume that people know what the split brain no, experiments that's worth going are, into but, no that's worth going to okay well they basically these are patients who's uh the corpus callosum or however you pronounce it which connects the fibers that connect the two hemispheres of the brain have been severed they have done this sometimes to stop seizures in any event there are people who have had it done for therapeutic reasons and they can study them in the laboratory and do interesting experiments because by controlling by dividing uh the perceptual you know controlling what goes into this eye and into that eye for example they can send some things into one half of the brain and not into the other half of the brain and so they can uh they can issue a command to one side of the brain with, without again without that information entering the other side of the brain as it commonly would through the through the bridge that has been severed and um they can give a command like get up and walk toward the door okay that is a command presented really to only half of the brain and then the person gets up and, and walks toward the door. And then they say to the person, where are you going? And that question is asked of the other side of the brain that, that focuses on, on language. And the person says, oh, well, I'm going to get a drink of water. I mean, they, they, they come up with an explanation and they believe that that was actually the motivation. So there have been a number, uh, a number of uh, kinds of experiments that cast doubt on the idea that the part of us that we think of as making the decision to do certain things is really making that decision. And that raises the possibility that something else is actually determinative uh, and that what, what this kind of conscious you is, is, uh, is something that among other things creates a story about your motivations and that's the story you share with the world. So it's kind of like a, maybe like a public relations um, agent. And so the, anyway, there's a lot of uh, different kinds of experiments that lend 
credibility to the idea that the CEO self, this consciously experienced CEO self is not real. And meanwhile, there's this, uh, there's this model called the modular theory of the brain. I have to be careful because different people mean different things by modular, a modular uh, model of the brain. But as originally developed, well, as developed by evolutionary psychologists like Lita Cosmetis, especially, and, and, and John Tooby, um, and written about by one of uh, her students, Ron Kurz, uh, Rob Kurzban, in his book, um, uh, what is it? It's uh, Why Everyone is a Hypocrite or something. Um, the, uh, the idea there is actually, you know, as evolution proceeded, lots of different mental agents evolved. It didn't, they didn't, you know, the human brain didn't show up at once. And so, and, and so, and presumably, for example, the part that attracts us to a sex partner or attracts us to food uh, evolved earlier than the part of us that say recognizes a person of high status and uh, induces us to try to impress that person, right? So if you've ever been like at a cocktail party and say you're talking to someone who's important and you like, but you're really hungry and you can kind of see the hors d'oeuvres and it, if you pay attention, it really feels like two different parts of you tugging, right? There's like, oh, I really want, I'd really like to make an excuse and leave. But then there's this party that's like, no, you don't, you're not rude to this particular, rude to this particular person. That is a, you know, is kind of a, a caricature of, uh, of, of how two, in some, sometimes competing parts of the brain could be operating at the same time. But that does capture the spirit of the modular model, which is that, you know, the mind is, uh, it has a lot of little functions uh, and, you know, lots of pieces of machinery designed to do different things, which isn't to say they're not integrated into a whole in important senses, they are. But to some extent, um, they may be wrestling for control of consciousness, okay? And, you know, and you, you, you uh, Maybe it may be an exa a, a very different kind of example of this is sometimes like, you know, you're in a, you're, you're, uh, well, say there's a, there's a conversation you're not, you know, there's several conversations in the room and suddenly you pick up on the fact that somebody mentioned your name and maybe it's just your first name. They're not talking about you, but anyway, suddenly you're hearing that part of the conversation but and yet you were not conscious of monitoring that so apparently at an unconscious level there's something that like monitors conver the set various conversations and it's not intruding on your consciousness but once it has a good reason to it rests it you know it steers your consciousness in its direction that's another example of how modules are off doing different kinds of work and looking for different things maybe um and at any given time your consciousness may be dominated by one or a small number of modules. Yeah, I think that um, that particular example of of noticing your name when it's spoken um, was actually there were kind of experiments that parallel that, right? Where you you have um, this dyotic listening paradigm where you have on a headphone with different sounds played in each in each ear, and you're supposed to attend to one and repeat back certain words. You know, very simple task, and then they'll play something else like a radio program in the other ear. And if you ask people, you know, what did you consciously perceive? They can't tell you very much at all of what of what they heard in that ear. So there's there's no mm -hmm. conscious processing, it seems. But if their name is spoken, suddenly the attention flips and and then they pay right. attention. And I remember being an undergraduate and learning that. And that was one of the moments when I I was so blown away that such a simple paradigm could unveil something that I would have thought was impossible. That that level of of meaning extraction, that level of sophisticated programming, could kind of be executed in the brain way below the level of, of conscious perception. Um, so, but I also think, yeah, the thing you said about, it's surprising or it's kind of weird to reflect on how evolution wove us together with, in a very kind of hacky way, in a way where it just kind of built new things on top of old things. You know, we start out with this kind of worm-like body plan effectively with a kind of mouth and chemical sensors at one end, which we, which we retain. And as you say, it takes a long time before we have to hack on these kind of, these other modules. Um, but you also point to the, um, the the fact that this is also integrated, right? The modular 
the modules kind of emphasizes the the differentiated parts but i and maybe an, another branch of science that's useful for for thinking about this is um when we think about kind of complex self self-organizing systems you know you have instead of a hierarchical system where you have the, the thing at the top kind of issuing commands or designing the levels below instead you have an organism that comes into existence through kind of interdependent cooperation with all of its parts there is no ruler mm -hmm. but just through mm -hmm. evolution and through the life process you get this kind of kind of anarchic ecological interdependent emergence uh, with no ruler within the system but also beyond the system i mean and this is you know in the book i distinguish between the kind of uh well first i should say like the the view we've been talking about where what's really going on the mind is is yeah it's a little more like it's like an ecosystem or it's like uh a bunch of of agents doing their business sometimes competing with one another um and then ordinary consciousness has in a sense a distorted view of what's going on because it, it, it's any moment not paying attention to most of what's going on in your mind um it I mean, I don't think we can, we can, it's possible to attain a level of consciousness uh, realistically where you're, you're aware of all that's actually going on under the surface. But I do think it's possible at a meditation retreat, and you may have had this experience to, um, well, for example, if you identify less with your feelings, um, it, just to start identifying less with your thoughts and your feelings. And uh, and in principle, this can happen in ordinary daily meditation, but um, it, it's easier to get into a deep state of meditation as a, as a long multi-day retreat unfolds than it is in your, in your daily practice. And on retreat especially, um, I've gotten to the point where um, thoughts, they don't seem to be coming from me. They seem to be kind of showing up, which makes sense. I mean, different kinds of thoughts are presumably injected into consciousness by different modules or by different combinations of modules. And that's probably the way to think of it is that they're being sent into consciousness um, and not that the, the conscious you is generating them. And on a retreat, when you calm your mind, it can start to seem more like that. These thoughts are like kind of clouds passing by the same thing with feelings and I just think there's good reason to believe that that's actually a truer view of what's going on. Now, I talk about that as kind of the um, the interior, well, maybe not a full on not self experience, but a kind of a version of of, of an interior not self experience. I've also had, and, and this takes us back to what I was saying about the fact that the interconnections go beyond your body. You're, you know, it's like right now, you are are like a very fundamental influence on everything I'm thinking and saying, right? I, I am in in interaction with you. And um and you can get to a point on retreat where the bounds of self, and I think of this as kind of an exterior version of not self-experience, but the bounds of self start to um dissolve. I've had the experience where like uh, I'm hearing a bird song and I'm feeling my foot tingle and it doesn't seem to me that the foot tingling is any more part of me than the bird singing. And, you know, in my book, I actually try to mount a defense that that may be a plausible view of what's going on. That that, And, and people, as are, you know, William James wrote about uh, things like this, like the difficulty of really analytically drawing the bounds of self um, clearly. So um, anyway, I, I think of these are two kinds of experiences you can have through meditation that I think maybe give, give you a clear view of what's actually going on. And they also can lead you into what I referred to earlier, that kind of the moral dimension of not self, where if I'm thinking that like the bird is as much a part of me as my foot, well, I'm presumably less likely to kill the bird, right? 